off of. And so today we're going to have some fun talking about heroes and real life heroes, ordinary heroes. So we're taking a break from the Love and Marriage series. And so hit the pause button on that. We'll pick it up again next week like Amy was saying. The truth is it's brought up too many issues in people's marriages. <laughs> marriages are struggling. Me and Amy have been fighting just way too much. And... I'm like, we, gotta, we can't do this, Amy. We've got to take a break. Like, you got, she's got lots of issues she needs to work through. And so hopefully this week we can finish working through those. And uh, next week we'll be doing love and marriage. And she's got a lot of issues. They're all called me, right? Me. I'm all your issues, right? Name Tyrone. If we're honest, right? So I'm looking forward to next week. Next week's going to be a lot of fun as we finish the love and marriage series from the roof, out in the parking lot. So I hope you can join us next week. It's going to be great. But today is Heroes Sunday, and we're going to talk about how we can't be everyone's hero, but we can be someone's hero. There's a lot of needs out there, a lot of people that need help. It'd be fun to help everybody, but we can't help everyone. We can't be a hero to everyone, but we can be a hero to someone. And so I want to take some time and just honor some people that are real-life heroes. And I came across some cool stories this last week. One was about a lady named... Terry, we call her Grandma Terry. You know, during quarantine, when people are stuck at home, she began to sew masks herself. She made her own masks. She made about 50 masks and mailed them all to her family across uh, the states. Word spread, people loved her mask, and people started requesting masks from Grandma Terry. And so while she was stuck at home alone for most of the year, she made over 600 masks by herself as an 89-year-old woman. Isn't that awesome? Like, she is, she's a hero to a lot of people. Came across this lady who was honored last year, Linda Herring. She's 75 years old last year, and for the last 50 years, she has taken in over 500 foster kids into her home. Five, over 500 foster She is a real-life hero. She said every time she got a call from the county, she never said no. She always took kids in, even if they were in extreme circumstances. They were really struggling. Even if they were, they were handicapped or there was any issues, she says, I, I, took, I just love kids. She's been a mom to over 500 kids in the last 50 years. She is a hero. I want to honor someone in-house for us. we got lots of people that volunteer and serve. we got lots of heroes in our church. I just appreciate so many of you that serve. I want to honor one guy, Joseph De Jesus. He shows up early every Sunday, and he serves every Sunday. And there he is with his beautiful wife, Ebony. And, uh, oh, he's back there. He's back there. Okay, he's in the back. He made it. Come on. And uh, he sets up the kids' ministry stuff over in the other building, so he takes it all over there, helps get it set up, and the kids' ministry is really thankful for him. And then he, after this service, will help tear it down and put it away, and uh, every week he does that faithfully serving and providing an environment for kids to meet Jesus, hear about Jesus, grow in their relationship with Jesus. And so, Joseph, thank you so much, because he's just like a local hero for us and, and for our kids. And uh, in first service, I mentioned Mark, who is also here again today. Mark did that last year by himself. With his kids, I remember. And so pre-quarantine, Mark did that for Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. I just appreciate guys like that. They are heroes, local heroes. And so there's a few categories of heroes I want to honor right now that became very important to us in this last year. And if you are a first responder connected to any of those, you know, paramedic, EMT, firefighter, police officer, if you are one of those, I'd love for you to stand to your feet. If you're online and you're one of those, Put your name in the comments. Come on, don't be ashamed because we want to honor those people. If, you, if that's you, if you're connected to that, stand your feet. Let's just honor them right now. Anybody, let's just give them a hand. We, we, we are so thankful for our first responders. And we have a fire truck out, actually out there in the parking lot. Is it there already? Yeah, okay, I didn't check. But, uh, and some firefighters. So it's kind of cool to, to honor them, you know, thank them in what they do to serve our city when you see them out there. I'm just having fun with them out there. Kids can explore the fire truck. We got a, a police officer, police car that will be swinging in, uh, hopefully in, in pretty soon. And so just this is the day where we're wanting to honor heroes like that that are serving our city on a regular basis. I also want to honor all of our health care workers. This year especially, we want to honor them. If that's you, if you're involved in health care, come on, stand to your feet. Anybody online? Thank you. Online. Put your name in the comment online. We'd love to hear from you. But boy, this year more than ever, we, we really appreciated them as they were on the front lines battling this healthcare crisis, this pandemic we've been a part of. And so 
all, we got quite a few people in our church connected to this, and so, so thankful to all of you that, that serve and work in that. You guys are heroes. Other heroes that we want to honor today are teachers. Come on, let's give it up for all the teachers and all they've gone through this. Life. Stand your feet, teachers. Any teachers in the house? Come on, here we go. Teachers. Thank you. Again, online, let us know. Put your name out there. Say, I'm a teacher, and say it loud and proud, okay, because you need to be. Uh, teachers, you've gone through a lot this year. Oh, Lord. I just, I, I, all my friends that are teachers, I have a, my sister's a teacher. Like, oh, man, like what they've gone through, along with the healthcare work. I mean, it's just been a lot. So thank you, teachers, for all that you guys do. They are heroes this year and still having to deal with a lot of stuff. What a stressful, crazy year. So the last group of people we want to thank are all the parents who have kids still at home, stuck in school. Okay, come on, all the parents. Come on, parents, stand up. Your kids are at home. Come on. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Oh, man, parents, talk about a year. You've not only been a parent, you also have been a teacher. Some of you are, maybe we have parents who are also our teachers who are also working in healthcare. Like, they're all of these roles. Okay, so it's like, what a challenging year to be a parent of a child at home trying to do school. And for all the people who mocked homeschool people for, for years and years and years, and then they all became one. <laughs> it was like, wow. Uh, not by choice, obviously, but um, what, it was a challenge for everybody. And so parents, I'm just praying grace on you guys. You guys are heroes, honestly. Any parent's a hero, okay? All parents are heroes, okay? But I just wanted to take a moment and just honor those that have kids at home <laughs> that are trying to do the whole school, the school thing. That's what a year. And uh, speaking of cool parents, we have uh, Amy's brother and our brother and sister-in-law are here with us hanging out today. They're right there. First time joining us at Rivers Church. And so it's just fun to have them here, here with us. It's something that's very special, obviously, for us and for Amy especially. And so parents, can I just just give you just some words of encouragement and just a, a prayer, if I can. Like, I'm just praying that God, by His Spirit, will fill you with the fruit of the Spirit. Pa- patience, <laughs> peace, gentleness, all those things. I'm praying all those things will come out of you in your life. Come on, guys. As God's people, we need His Spirit alive and at work within us. We can't do this in our own strength. Don't try to do anything in your own strength. Let the Spirit of God empower you and strengthen you, especially as you're trying to homeschool and, and parent and all that kind of stuff. And so, man, parents, just uh, we honor you today. You guys are heroes. And years ago, I decided I do want to be a hero. But more than anything else, I want to be a hero in my own home. It's the biggest, one of the biggest prayers of my life. I just want to encourage you, parents, echo that prayer, make that a prayer, make that, it's really a goal that it's at the forefront of my heart and my, my brain. I can serve so many people, especially in my line of work. I can get caught up serving way too much, helping way too many people, and I could neglect those closest to me and more than, I, I do want to be a hero. I want to help people. I want to serve people, but more than anything, I want to be a hero in my own home. And I pray, parents, that you are a hero to lots of people, but more than anybody else, I pray that you're a hero in your own home. And again, I'm praying, I'm praying for you parents this year as we continue to navigate all this, right? So let's have some fun. We're going to talk about being a hero. And as I was thinking about this this week, I thought, you know, there's times we got to make sure we take care of ourselves. Like we're serving, especially as a parent, and, and some of you have different, you know, vocations where you're constantly serving and helping other people. And we can easily serve so many people to the neglect of ourselves. Don't neglect serving yourself, helping yourself. Now, God, by his grace, can use any of us in our imperfections, even while we're, we're working through stuff, even while we're stuck in, in bad habits, in sinful habits, different things. God can still use us. We can be a blessing. We can be a hero. And I'm thankful for that. But uh, we want to make sure we're taking care of issues in our life. Maybe you're stuck. Maybe there's some habits in your life that you need to break. And I want to encourage you to jump into the freedom course. In two weeks, we're starting the Freedom Course. The Freedom Course ends with the Freedom Conference. And this whole experience, I promise you, will profoundly impact your life and what you believe about Jesus and who he is and the freedom that he has for you in your life. It is an incredible course. Some of us did it last fall. How many of you guys did it last fall? Okay, raise your hand. It was, it was so good. If you did it last fall and you want to do it again, go for it. It's actually going to feel different. We've got new leadership, and it's going to look and feel different. So 
if you didn't do it last fall, you want to jump in, I would encourage you to do it. It starts in just two weeks. we got an in-person option on Monday nights and an online option on Thursday nights. So either one, whatever works for you. So all of you online people that are joining us, you can join us with the Thursday night online option. And I promise you, you will be glad you did it. So I just mentioned that because I just was thinking about how you know, God can still use us while we're working through our junk, but we, want, we don't want to stay stuck in our junk. Jesus wants you free, and so jump into the freedom course, and uh, that'll help you learn and understand how to grow in the freedom that Jesus has for you. Amen? So today we're talking about heroes, and I want to talk about an organization called Feed One. Some of us, we've heard of Feed One before, uh, but many of us, this is going to be a brand new organization, but Feed One is a program that I wholeheartedly believe in, and it feeds kids, and it's a, it's a ministry, an organization that you and I can support. And if you give $10 a month to Feed One, you will support one kid for an entire month and get that kid food for a month, just for $10 a month. And so I'm going to ask you to consider supporting Feed One today, giving to Feed One. Here's the scary but true statistics. It said, they say approximately 21,000 people a day will die from hunger-related causes. That's a lot. It means a person will die every 3.6 seconds from hunger. It's a lot of people globally. One out of every three people on this planet is starving. And so when you begin to think about that, you can think it's, it's, it's overwhelming. Okay, the needs can be so big. How can we possibly make a difference? But Feed One is one of these programs that we can just do something small and make a difference. Because we can't be everyone's hero, but we can be someone's hero, right? And so I want to show you a video about Feed One. I actually had the opportunity to go and experience Feed One myself. I flew to El Salvador. I got to meet Feed One leadership in that country. I got to serve with them at a school. I got to serve kids food. And I got to see this organization is, is legit. They're doing incredible things. And so I want to show you a video. We put together a video of when I was there. So here's my disclaimer on the video. I will greet a church called Bell Road Church. Okay, It's a church that used to exist. And uh, so we did this video a year and a half ago when we used to call ourselves that, but we have relaunched into a new season. We are now Rivers Church. But that's why it says Bell Road Church, in case some of you are, are confused. But watch this video about Feed One. Hello, Bell Road Church, Tyrone here, and I am on the ground in El Salvador. I'm hanging out in a town called Tacuva. It's up in the mountains of El Salvador, and I just got to experience feeding children at this school, and I had the privilege of feeding them through this organization called Feed One, which is an amazing organization that we're beginning a relationship with. So let me tell you about Feed One. They are feeding kids all over the world, globally about 200,000 kids, but here in El Salvador, 67,000 kids that they are feeding already and their goal is to get that to 100,000 in just the next couple of years. And they're not just feeding kids, they got a garden in the back of the school here and they're teaching kids how to grow food, how to take care of themselves. They're teaching the kids and the families life skills. I just heard the director say, we don't want to feed their grandkids. So we're going to feed the kids, teach the kids how to grow food so that they can take care of their grandkids. And so I'm becoming a huge fan of Feed One. We're going to continue this relationship and we're going to support this organization because I believe in what they're doing. They're bridging Matthew 25, compassion, with Matthew 28, the Great Commission, and feeding kids physically, but they're feeding kids spiritually as well. This is an amazing organization and I can't wait to see what we can do as a church to support them and to help them fulfill their vision and to feed more kids. So at the end, we'll give you an opportunity to support a kid or two or three, however many you would like, however many you would feel led. But before supporting this organization, I had the opportunity to go and check it out. As you can see, I wanted to see what's this all about and came back just with a huge belief in who they are and in what they do. And we currently as a church still support 25 kids. It used to be quite a bit more than that, but in the last year and a half since we started partnering with Feed One, we've lost a few along the way. And I think some of those happened when 
credit card numbers change, you know, and then it just kind of drops off, you know, how things like that can happen. And so, but we're still at 25, so that's good. But my goal today, as I was thinking about today and praying about today, is I'd love to add 75 more kids. I'd love for us as a church to sponsor 100 kids through Feed One. And it's just one simple way that you and I can be a hero to a kid, some kids, to, to some families. Remember, we can't be everyone's hero, but we can be someone's hero, right? So we're going to look at a, a story in Luke chapter 10 that is going to clearly show us a hero. Luke chapter 10 is where we're going to be. And I'd love to have you stand. Would you stand right now? Let's stand for the reading of the word. I'm going to read this story here together. Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 25. If you're on your Bible, you'll see this is the story or the parable of the good Samaritan. Okay. Verse 25 says, on one occasion, an expert in the law, in other words, a lawyer, stood up and tested to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, and so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus says, and he doesn't answer the question, but he tells a story. I just love this about Jesus. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell in the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go, And do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, again, we're so thankful for your word and uh, how you reveal yourself to us in your word, how you uh, reveal who you are, what you're like, and how you've called us to live as your people, as your followers. And so, Lord, I, I pray, God, that you would help us to live out this story, that we could be modern day heroes for the people that are in our world, that are in our life. Lord, I pray that by your spirit, you'd stir up a passion, a love, a desire for others to make a difference, uh, to serve, uh, to have compassion, and to just be the best we can, do the best we can at being heroes in the people in our life. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you go and have a seat? So I think it's safe to say that the parable or the story of the Good Samaritan is the most popular story that Jesus tells. I try to think of one that would, like everybody would know, but this is one of those stories that kind of transcends even Christianity. Like a lot of people who may not even know about church or Jesus or Christianity, they've heard at least the term Good Samaritan, right? That's a very popular term. And so I think this is probably the most popular story that Jesus told. And I think there's a lot of good reasons for that. There is so much depth to this story. We're not going to even go into the depth of all that is in this. That we, we could, but we don't have time today. But I want to just pull out a few principles, a few simple principles from the parable of the Good Samaritan on how we can be heroes today. So if you're taking notes, we've got four things, four characteristics of what a hero looks like as we see in this story. Number one is this. A hero has compassion. If you think about it, The the thing that separates the Samaritan from everybody else in this story is compassion, right? Like, Like that's easily the thing you see that's totally different. Only one person shows compassion in this story, and it's the Samaritan. To this lawyer, this expert of law that's talking with Jesus, this wounded man is just a 
a subject of debate. To the robbers, he was an object to exploit. To the Levite and to the priest, he was just a, a problem to avoid. But to the Samaritan, he was a person to love. This Samaritan stands out far and above everybody else in the story because of how he served and showed compassion to this wounded man. The truth is, if we're going to show compassion to people, we've got to have a love for them. If I don't have a love for people, then I'm not going to care. I'm not going to notice. And compassion is not going to be a part of my life. And I think that's why Jesus wants us to live in love and to operate in love. In fact, in John 13, he talks about this. He says, um, by the, by everyone, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. If you love one another. That is what's going to demonstrate that you and I actually follow Jesus. We, we love him. We trust him. We are a disciple of Jesus. How? By how we love other people. Jesus said this in Matthew 5 also. He says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Jesus says, this is how I really want you to live. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Okay, that's an important statement there based upon what we're looking at here at the Good Samaritan. Because remember, this expert in the law is wanting to justify himself. He says, Jesus, who's my neighbor? And what is, he's essentially asking is, I have a definition of neighbor, and I just want to make sure you agree with my definition because I'm called to love these people who I think are my neighbor, but there's other people that aren't my neighbor. And so can you just tell me, Jesus, who my neighbor is to make sure that I know that I'm right? He's wanting to justify himself because there are certain people that he would not consider neighbor. He might even put them in enemy category, or at least he would look down on them as lesser than him. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you this, love your neighbor enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus is calling us to live drastically different than how the world would live. When we love people, we're going to see what they're going through. We're going to notice the needs and we can act in compassion. A hero has compassion. That's why I think Paul said, clothe yourself with compassion. He said this to the church in, in Colossae. Colossians 3, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. I just love the imagery of that. Like every day, put on clothes of compassion. Clothe yourself. Make sure you are wearing compassion with your life. If there's one thing our world needs more of, I'd say it's compassion, wouldn't you? We could give a lot more compassion right now. We say lots of judging. We could see more compassion out there. We see lots of um, fighting, quarreling, disagreement. There's lots of canceling going on, but compassion could go a long way, and that could cause you to stand out as different. We need to exercise compassion, and heroes have compassion. That's the first thing. That's really the first obvious thing you see in this story is that the Good Samaritan, who is a hero, shows compassion. Number two, a hero recognizes it costs him something. It's going to cost something. You want to serve people. You want to make a difference. You want to be a hero. It will cost you something. Now, what's interesting is the robbers in this story, they took full advantage of this guy. It didn't cost them anything, but they took this guy out, and they, they beat him up and stole things from him. And they, did, they put him down, beat him up for their own gain, and it didn't cost them anything. But this is actually how the world works. The world thinks this way. The world tends to act this way. You might say, well, come on, Tyrone, like, that's kind of extreme. Most people would look at this story and say, that's wrong. Like, robbers beating up a guy, taking things from him, taking his clothes, leaving him half dead, that's, that's wrong. It's not a good thing. It's not the right thing to do. But how often do we see people step on other people, put other people down so they can climb the corporate ladder? How often do we see friends throw another friend under the bus just so that it makes them look better or feel better or gain? How often do we lie or see other people lie for their own benefit? We can tend to do the same, th similar thing. Maybe not as bad, but very similar. See, the selfish heart of man can tend to do that, right? We can elevate ourselves at the expense of others. So the world... They like to sacrifice others so that they themselves can gain, but Jesus calls us to sacrifice ourselves so that other people can gain. That's how we're called to live. And Jesus speaks of this in Matthew 20. 
Matthew 20, verse 25. So what's going on here is one of the moms, two of the disciples, goes to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, you know, in the end, you're going to put my son on the right and the left, right? My two sons, they're going to be like the highest in position, right? Right? The sons are probably agreeing. They're probably excited about this. But it causes a little fight with all the disciples. Like, I'm better than you. I'm greater than you. I'm greater than you. I'm greater than you. Okay, so there's a little quarrel, which is understandable. It's going on. And so Jesus, verse 25 in Matthew 20, he calls them together and says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. A hero recognizes it costs him something. Jesus, being the greatest hero this world has ever seen, this world has ever known, recognized it was going to cost him something, and he gave his life for you and me, and we're thankful for that. But a hero's got to understand, it's going to cost you something. It might cost you your pride. Because other people may not think as highly as you want them to think of you. We like to, we kind of can get selfish, can't we? We want people to think good of us and people to see us and notice us and all that kind of stuff. But it might cost me my pride. It might cost me my time. It will cost you to serve people, to help people, to prepare to serve and, and, and do things for people. It can take time. It can take energy. It will cost you energy. It can even cost you your money. You want to be a hero? It will cost you something. You think about the Good Samaritan. He put down a large sum of money. He took care of this guy with his own money. Recognize, if I want to help this guy, it will cost him something. But heroes recognize it costs him something. Number three, a hero doesn't have to be seen. And this is a tough one for some. The Good Samaritan doesn't make it all about himself. He doesn't have a crowd of people that's just applauding him and, good job, you know, you're amazing, you know, okay? And the truth is, most heroic acts in our lifetime will never be noticed, and that's okay. That's totally okay, because that's not what it's about. If we think it is, then we're actually not a hero, because a hero doesn't have to be seen. A couple weeks ago, I witnessed something in our church that just moved my heart. It was... Uh, it's pretty touching, pretty amazing. And about three weeks ago, we lost our dear friend, Derek Johnson. And that following week, our seniors group, we got an incredible group of seniors in our church. They got together and collected up money and delivered it to the family. They just said, we just want to be a blessing to the family. We, you don't even know what you need, but here you go. And as they did that, I, you know, they didn't tell anybody. I just happened to, to know because they gathered at the church uh, so that the leaders, Phil and Virginia, didn't have to go to everybody's house. They said, just bring it to the church. And, but other than that, they didn't tell anybody. They just gathered a whole bunch of money, gave it to the family. They didn't post it online. They didn't even go through the church to get tax credit. They just gave it to their friends. That, my friends, now you know about it, so it's not unseen anymore, but still, you don't know who did it, so okay. <laughs> but that, my friends, is Heroic. That's just people being a hero in a very simple yet powerful way for a family. See, a hero doesn't have to be seen. I think true heroes understand that, and they make it about other people. In fact, I would say the true heroes are actually hero makers. They're the ones that like to make heroes out of other people. They like to lift other people up. You see, everyone loves to be the hero, but not enough people really long to be the hero maker. And that's what we need more of today, especially in our church. I pray for hero makers. I, I want to help people grow in their relationship with Jesus. I want to disciple them. I want to train them. I want to equip people in all walks of life. I want to raise them up. I want to encourage them. I want to be generous to them. I want to help them however I can. I want to be a hero maker out of other people. And I pray that that would be a spirit that sweeps through our church. True heroes don't have to be seen. In fact, they actually make heroes out of other people. So... A hero doesn't have to be seen. And lastly is this. Number four, a hero is willing to go the extra mile. And that's what this Samaritan does, right? He doesn't just do the minimum. He goes the extra mile. He even takes care of the extra expenses for this wounded man. 
puts him on his, you know, he bandages him up, puts him on his donkey, takes him to this, this, this hotel. They stay the night. And as he leaves, he gives approximately like $300 to the hotel and says, okay, here you go. Any other expenses? Here you go. It's on me. And if there's any more on top of that, I'll be back and I will pay for that as well. That's very generous. And that's someone who says, I'm just not going to do the minimum. I'm going to go the extra mile. And that's what heroes do. I just love the generosity of the Samaritan. Just think about that. I mean, he just took care of him, put him up, put money into this. Uh, you know, generosity is a natural outward expression of the inward attitude of our heart. It just comes out of us. If generosity is in us, it's going to come out of us. If it's in us, it's going to come out of us. It demonstrates where our heart is. That's why Jesus says where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Right? And so how we spend our money, where we invest our money, how we, where we put our money, all of that shows where our treasure is, where our heart is. And so a hero is generous, willing to go the extra mile and even give above and beyond. So those are just a few things we can pull out of this really cool, really famous, but really profound story called the Good Samaritan. A hero has compassion. A hero recognizes it costs something. A hero doesn't have to be seen, and a hero is willing to go the extra mile, and I pray that that would describe our lives as well. I love how Jesus ends the story. He tells the story, and then at the end, in verse 36, he says, so which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the one who fell into the hands of robbers? Because remember, that was the whole point of the story. And Jesus, who is neighbor? How do we define neighbor? And so Jesus is like, okay, now who would you say is the neighbor here? For the purpose of our theme here today, we could actually say this. Who of those three people in the story was a hero to the person who fell into the hands of the robbers? It's the Samaritan. Now what I love about the story is that this story would have resonated very strongly, even very emotionally to Jesus' hearers. Because this the thought that Jesus would use a lowly Samaritan as the hero of this story would have kind of caused them to be a little bit upset, maybe even bothered, because they looked down on Samaritans. They can understand the priest and the Levite being a part of the story. You know, the next person coming along who was going to help the person, they probably would have guessed was just like some normal Jewish guy, maybe a shepherd or somebody, but they would have never guessed and they themselves would have never inputted Samaritan as the hero into the story. Jesus is very intentional about this. He's proven a point in so many different ways. But these Samaritans were looked down upon by Jews. They were underclass. They were half-breeds. They weren't good enough. And this story that Jesus tells us really is a story about the unlikeliest of heroes. Somebody who other people wouldn't have picked to be a hero is a hero in this story, which gives hope for us all. Any of us can be a hero. It kind of reminds me of like the hobbits in Lord of the Rings, right? They're, they're the heroes of Middle Earth, the un, most unlikeliest of characters in the whole story. They become the heroes. It's kind of like that. Jesus inserts Samaritan in there, and, they, and he is the hero of the story. See, anyone can be a hero. And you can't be everyone's hero, but you can be someone's hero. Amen? Jesus tells us another story about when he comes back, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, and, and he's going to tell the sheep, you did all these things for me, and you, know, you fed me, you clothed me, you took care of me. And in verse 40, it says this, in Matthew 25, verse 40, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And he said that out of the response of like, hey, when did we do that? I don't remember giving it to you. And so Jesus responded, hey, whenever you served anybody, even people that are considered the least of these, you did it for me. And I pray that as we serve, as we love, as we show compassion, as we help people, as we try to be heroes to the people in our world, the people around us, that we would do it all for the glory of God. It's not about us. It's about him. It's about, you know what? The truth is I just love God. And he's got so much love for me. I just got to give his love away. I just got to serve. He's given me compassion for you and for this situation and for these people. And so we do it all for him. We don't make it about us, but we make it about him. And so this story where Jesus talks about you did this for the, whatever you did to the least of these, you did for me. 
is a story about Jesus coming back, his, his return, when the end happens. And I think sometimes it's good for us to think about the end, to think with the end in mind. When I think about, hey, when I get to the end of my life, how I'm living now, is it going to line up for how I want to have lived when I get to the end? It's good for us to have that kind of perspective, to have an eternal perspective. I mean, just imagine, like, you're coming to the end of your life, you're in your last hours, maybe. You're, on, you're lying on a bed in a room in your last hours. Your family's gathered around you. They're there. They're there with you. God calls you into your eternal reward. Jesus meets you there. You're in heaven. He shows you this home. He's been preparing for you all this time. You're walking the streets of gold. You turn around. There's a whole line of people waiting just to see you because they want to thank you. And in that moment, what would you want people to thank you for? It's good to think about things like that. What do you want people to thank you for in the very end? It helps put things in perspective. Because a lot of things that we worry, we stress about, we strive for, we long for, we need, but do they really matter? What do you want people to thank you for in the end? You know, there's so many needs out there, guys. And we look around the world, and it can feel overwhelming. And that's why I just want to encourage you just to do what you can. This week, today... Just do what you can. You can't be everyone's hero, but you can be someone's hero. I love what Andy Stanley said. He says, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. That's good. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Find one person and start a go group. You never know how that could literally change their life or even your life. By the way, these go groups are still a big deal to us, and... Love to hear from you. If you haven't responded to that questionnaire, you can text the number. It's on the screen here. It's just a simple four-question questionnaire because we want to hear from you, want to help you, want to see how these groups are going, how they're starting, uh, because it's a big deal. Maybe there's somebody that God wants to lay on your heart that you can reach out to. Maybe they don't even know Jesus, but they'd be willing just to get together and just talk about the Bible and talk about God and learn and grow, and God could use you. Just reaching out to that one person, and it could have an eternal impact on their life. You start with one. That's all it takes. Mother Teresa famously said this. She says, if you can't feed 100, then feed one. If you can't feed 100, then just feed one. And that's actually the very quote that gave us the name of the Feed One organization. Pastor Chris, who's a coach of mine, uh, a friend of ours, uh, we're connected to him and his church and his network, that him and some of his leaders coach our people. And he launched Feed One. He actually is the guy that came here a year and a half ago, and he spoke, and he brought this to our church for the first time. And so we talked about this, why we're still sur- or supporting 25 kids. And uh, he's the guy that had this idea, this vision. As he saw kids, as he was overseas with Convoy of Hope, seeing these kids, they need, they need to food, and they're missing out. And so they're on a mission. And currently, Feed One supports 380,000 children globally. 380. Their goal by the end of the year is to get to 400,000. That's the goal. I would love it if we could get to 100 today just to be a part of Feed One and what they're doing and and help them get there. Because this is just a simple way that you and I can be heroes to some kids and some families. It's a global organization. You can actually see in this, this map here all the different countries that Feed One is in, and Feed One is, is serving. They're doing a great job, tremendous job, serving hundreds of thousands of, of kids and families. And so I want to show you a story about a girl named Kate who was directly impacted by Feed One. This will just get you a little, get you a little insight as to what they do and, and how they can affect individual kids and then eventually affect families and communities. So watch the story about Kate from the Philippines. Yes, sometimes I go to bed, I have no food in my stomach. If I don't have enough food, I, I can't 
concentrate in my studying and I can't understand what my teacher was saying to me. Thank you because the food that they give to us will, will not be <laughs> will not be wasted. I'm turning 16 this November. I'm in college. I'm taking up hotel and restaurant services. By God's grace, um, we have our food now. I'm so grateful and I will be forever grateful that Convoy of Hope is um, as a sponsor of our church for me to continue my study and have my meal. <laughs> Sometimes before, I'm thinking that we're the, the most <laughs> poor people in the world but as I'm uh, looking around, uh, here at our community, I saw a lot of people, they were more poor than us. Studying hard now um, for my future and someday I promise to myself that I'm going to help them, help, help my community here, our community and our church that, and I will and someday become the sponsor of our church. Yeah, he liked you guys. So thankful. <laughs>
And then step number three would be to fill out your payment information on the back. And again, this is very safe and very secure to do this. You know, once you seal that envelope, very safe. They, their, their information has never been compromised. So you don't have anything to worry about there. Fill out your payment information. Anybody do this stuff enough? You just have all your numbers memorized, like your card, your pin, all that kind of stuff. You know, the security number, you got it all. It's like, yep, it's all already in my brain. And then when you're done with that, go ahead and just place the card uh, in the envelope and, and seal it up. And again, it'll be safe and secure at that point. And what you can do is you can drop this envelope. You can just drop it in the bucket. So when we leave here today, go out there, you can just drop it right in that bucket there, which is the same bucket we drop our offering envelopes and our connect cards and all that. You can also drop that in there. And so can I just say thank you guys. Thank you so much for considering this, for being generous, for supporting some kids through Feed One. This is just one of the many ways that we can be a hero uh, to people. And I just believe that God wants to use you to be a hero in people's lives, to make a difference in people's lives. And I pray that God will anoint you and empower you to do that. Why don't we all stand to our feet? We're gonna close in prayer here and we're gonna sing one last song and look to Jesus here. But if you're here today and you're joining us in person or even online and you've never said yes to Jesus, you've never discovered the life that he has for you, I'd encourage you to say yes to him today. Commit to following him, find out the life that Jesus has for him. He really is the greatest hero ever. In, in human history because of what he did for us. He gave his life. Like we've all sinned and separated ourselves from God. But Jesus took our sin on the cross, paid that penalty, restored our relationship back to God when we accept what he did for us. He restored uh, the relationship of mankind back to our creator, to God. He is the ultimate hero. So say yes to Jesus today. Commit to following him. And if you're ready to do that, let us know. We'd love to help you with that, pray with you in that, and help you move forward in that. And for all of you, I'm just gonna pray that God will anoint you and use you to be a hero, to serve, to love, to have compassion, to be generous the best you possibly can in your life. Would you join me in prayer right now, Lord? Thank you so much for all that you've done for us. You first loved us. That's why we love you. And out of that love, Jesus, we just want to give it away. Oh, we just want to serve. We just want to help people. We want people to know that they matter. So, Lord, help us to do that. Help us to see needs. Lord, give us love and compassion. So we see people, see needs, and we serve, we, we give, we help. We're there for people. Lord, I pray that you'd, that you'd use us, anoint us, fill us. And, God, I pray that we would be heroes hero makers. Lord, raise up hero makers, I pray, in this church. Uh, and ultimately, Jesus, we recognize it's all about you and all that you've done for us. And so we worship you and we praise you. And that's why we take these last few minutes just again to look to you, Jesus, because it's all about you. It's not about us. It's about you and what you've done. And it's about the victory that you won on that cross for us. And so we're going to declare loudly and clearly who you are today, who you are in these last moments. Your name is victory. It's who you are. It's who you are.